proceeding to order. Roll call. Mayor Tonita Gurlengidon. Present. Councilor David G. Romero. Present. Councilor Barbara Casey. Here. Councilor Vincent Howell. Present. Councilor David A. Udibari Jr. Here. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilor Howell, would you give me a moment of silence, please? Moment of silence. <clears throat> please keep in mind all of the residents in our states of Florida and the East Coast that it's being affected by this hurricane. I understand Hurricane Michael is very, very uh, devastating right now. So please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the council, the next item is the approval of the agenda. <clears throat> okay, what is the pleasure of the report? Madam Mayor. Councilor Casey. I move approval of the agenda as presented. Okay, is there, is there a second? Second. Okay, roll call. Councilor Ulibari Jr. Yes. Councilor Casey. Yes. Councilor Romero. Yes. Councilor Howell. Yes. I have a motion by Councilor Casey, a second by Councilor Howell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, Madam Mayor, members of the council, is public input. The first person we have is Mr. Leo Maestas talking about the uh, OEM officials workshop. Mr. Maestas. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome, Mr. Maestas. Madam Mayor, City Manager. So you all, you all know that uh, the Office of Emergency Management brings in periodically uh, classes that we administer to our first responders. So we wanted to bring in a class that was geared more towards our senior officials. Um, so this class that we're bringing in here is actually being administered tomorrow. Uh, it's a very highly sought after class. Yeah, we're on a six month waiting list to get it. So Tix is coming in tomorrow to uh, uh, give us this instruction on senior officials workshop for all hazards preparedness. Um, this workshop provides a forum for senior officials to understand strategic and executive level issues related to all hazards disaster preparedness to share proven strategies, best practices, and to enhance coordination among all community officials responsible for emergency preparedness response in the subject. This workshop emphasizes planning, operational coordination, and public information and warning through extensive group uh, discussions and tabletop exercises that will take place in the afternoon. Um, this class will begin at 8 o'clock tomorrow at Mexico High University uh, in the governance room in 322. Um, it's geared again towards our elected and senior officials, so um, uh, it gives you a list there of participants of who it's geared towards. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masters. And there'll be um, the, uh, I'll be attending this workshop as well as other board, uh, as other uh, department head. Uh, department heads will, will also be attending. Mm -hmm. It's uh, according to Mr. Maestas, he's indicated that it's a good workshop. It'll tell us what we should do and how we should proceed with uh, emergencies and, and, and things of that sort. So we have quite a few of the department heads attending as well. Thank you. Do you have a question? Is uh, um, how long is this class? <coughs> it starts at 8 and it should be done. So the morning, it starts at 8. Uh, 8 to, to 12 is an instructional workshop part of it and then after lunch one to three is a tabletop with an exercise based around uh, an incident here in Las Vegas. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a minute. Oh, I just, um, I'm, I'm looking, I, I did, I think this is the, I have a certification for this already. Uh, if I do, would it help any if I give you the certificate for it? Or? Either way, yeah, we would like everybody there so we can work through this in a way. Okay. It'll be, be a local, Local, local scenario. Okay. Our, uh, we were looking at different scenarios having to do with maybe an active shooter, um, uh, something having to do with the fiestas. Uh, there's been a lot of incidents where people are using cars as uh, battering rams to go through crowds, and we're using that actually as a scenario for, for tomorrow's class. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Next, the next person on our public input forum is Mr. Marshall Poole on animal control. Mr. Poole. Madam Mayor and Councilors. Um, just a brief report on, on September. Um, we took in 172 animals in September. That's 
average of between five and six animals per day. Uh, 103 dogs total, including 40 puppies. Um, and that's with 32 counts. So we have an average daily population of more than 60 um, in, in the shelter. That's dogs and then cats as well. Um, 164 of those 172 animals came in unidentified. And again, as I've mentioned in previous months, this is one of our biggest problems. We have no idea to whom these animals belong. And that makes it very difficult, almost impossible to return it to those, to those guardians. Um, and it also means that we have to start figuring out where to send these animals for now to find them without their home. We did return 39 of the animals to, uh, to their owner guardians because we could figure out who, who they are. Uh, one of them had to be returned twice, unfortunately. <laughs> again, uh, we adopted 29 of those animals locally. Uh, we trapped 37 feral cats um, and sent them for spay and neuter, and that was entirely paid for by a uh, private grant from Santa Fe. We transported 54 animals to seven different agencies in Colorado. We're still having one of the agencies in Colorado Springs, uh, High Peak <laughs> Animal Shelter. Has a, still has an outbreak of canine pneumonia, so they can't receive any animals and they can't use, they can't transport any animals. So they are under total quarantine. And of course, we don't want to send any of our animals there because they're in, they're in danger. Um, 30 volunteers donated more than 300 hours during the month. We still have the United World College students coming over every Friday afternoon to walk dogs and spend time with the cats, which we really appreciate. Zero bite holds in September. Previous month, you may remember, we had six bite holds. So it's very weather related. So in this hot summer month, there are more incidents with citizens being bit. Um, we transported 19 citizen owned dogs and cats for spaying for low cost spaying $25. Um, and if they can't pay that, um, they we waive that. We also transported 10 strays and surrendered animals for that same service. Um, we had one incident that's pretty unusual, but still also in some ways typical. We had one dog that, that was abandoned in a home for eight days and abandoned locked in their bathroom and uh, had no food, no water. Um, it was in terrible uh, condition when, when we took custody of it. Um, it was, uh, we called the dog Saru. Um, terrible wounds and um, horrible teeth and just really abandoned. And the owner was cited by animal control and had to, was found guilty in the municipal court and had to pay fines for animal abandonment and animal death neglect. And uh, we're trying to save that animal. We may, we may or may not be able to because it was eight days in that room without food and without water. Uh, on a happier note, um, in November is our annual Art Bark fundraiser. And all of you, mayor and council, will receive invitations to that. It's going to be at the trolley building on the university campus. Dr. Minner is going to be the official uh, auctioneer with his bow tie. And uh, we have 60 plus pieces that um, are really beautiful. From what I understand, they were all jury this year, the jury show, which means that three judges have to agree, uh, three artist, artist judges have to agree that these are the quality that we are looking for before it's entered in the show. And there are a number of unjury pieces that are also donated for for sale. So looking forward to that. It's May, uh, November 2nd and 3rd. Uh, November 2nd is a special um, invitation only um, reception for the artists and for donors and for other officials like elected officials. And then the actual show is on, on the 3rd of November in Colorado. So any, uh, any questions? Questions, comments? Thank you very we're much. We're in the process Good. of finishing negotiating the contract with yes. the city and we're oh, looking forward to that. Um, as we're especially glad that this is well, should be a four-year contract, exactly. which will give us time to go out and raise more money. And uh, our vision, again, is that we need a new shelter. 
And uh, so this will give us some of the ammunition that we need to go out and raise money for that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Poole. The last person on public input is Mr. Lee Einer regarding the police chief. Good evening, Mr. Einer. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. Good evening. I'm here to express some concerns about the newly appointed police chief. Um, what's come out in the media, of course, is I'm sure common knowledge to everyone in this room. Um, with, without expressing personal opinions uh, and my beliefs in the matter, I will express some knowledge in the matter. Uh, it's my understanding that City Council may not have been apprised of the ongoing lawsuit against the new police chief regarding the incident on Highway 14, and you may not have been apprised before you took your vote regarding the guilty plea for uh, domestic abuse, domestic assault in 1991. And I'm perplexed by that because a background check by a law enforcement professional should at the minimum have been able to produce at least as much information as the average 12 year old can get in 15 minutes with Google. And yet, it seems not to have happened. It seems that uh, perhaps full information was not shared with council before the time of the vote. And now, things are going to get a lot more complex, potentially, as uh, additional news unfolds. And I'm, I'm here to ask you, First of all, take a second look at that and ask yourselves if there's a process problem that needs to be addressed. And second of all, to support an external investigation, not a witch hunt, an external investigation that will either clear the police chief in a credible manner and protect his reputation, or if it goes the other way, protect the community. Thank you. That concludes our public input. Okay. Madam Mayor, members of the Council, we'll go on discussion items. The first item is the Department of Public Safety Grant for Las Vegas Police Department Street Crimes Unit for Overtime, <coughs> Confidential Funds, and Undercover Vehicle Maintenance. And we have Mr. <coughs> uh, Deputy Ken Jenkins to present. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this, these monies originally, I want to say it, it, uh, the application process started back in the last fiscal, um, fiscal budget. And basically what it is, it's what everyone identifies as the region, region grant or the JAG grant. <clears throat> Initially, we, we, through the course of past three years or so, the region has not died. A lot of people think that region, uh, as far as narcotic, narcotics enforcement has died within our community. It has not. Um, we we share the, the responsibility with other uh, counties to include Colfax, uh, Raton, um, Union, and Harding, to name a few. And because of certain things, th these monies were held up in litigation with the federal government, uh, with the, the sanctuary cities and, and all that stuff. And we, as a, as a department, decided that we can't, at this point, at that point, I should say, we can't um, spend too much time worrying about other counties. And we focused our energy, our enforcement within Las Vegas and, and San Miguel County. and we actually were having some problems with the county portion of it. So we applied for the funds through what we changed to be the streets crime unit. It used to be the narcotics uh, or the, the criminal investigation. But through some reorganization, we changed it to the street, street crimes unit. And with that, we were able to get the amount of funding that we did get. Uh, usually it was about 15,000. 
and then we would get other monies for other agencies, other counties, and we would have to give them their portion. Um, what we found is we were reverting a lot of those monies back because of um, the other counties weren't delivering. Um, we, we set some deliverables with them and it wasn't happening. So again, we focused on Las Vegas as, as a whole. And with that, we were able to get the 24,300. Um, again, um, it, it's for the overtime for confidential funding and it's for the street crimes unit, which the street crimes unit, it's not just one or two individuals uh, set to do narcotics enforcement. It's our entire investigative section, which is roughly about six individuals. So this money is, is for that and it is strictly for uh, narcotics tasks. Uh, enforce this. Questions, concerns? Questions, comments? Yeah. Okay, Councilor Howell. Thank you, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> Mr. Gallegos, Mr. Jenkins, Officer, Deputy Chief Jenkins. Uh, how often does this regional task force uh, relegated to give the council, governing body, uh, status reports? We do reports we, we're providing we provide our agency provides monthly reports in reference to narcotics and uh, criminal investigations calls for service things like that to the so, governing body or to um, administration to Pro it would be part of their progress reports yeah. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. you don't do a verbal one just a written one uh, with, uh, within your progress reports it's it's usually a pro we don't have uh, verbal uh, progress reports by each department head. We usually just uh, submit those to mayor council. We could if if you chose to change yeah. the format. I personally would like it, but it's up to. Uh, and our our and our our reports are pretty self-explanatory. We do calls for service, and we get into our criminal <coughs> investigation. Um, how much? Because we are required to report to uh, the feds as well, or. Uh, the state, um, how many arrest warrants we've served, search warrants, uh, drugs, what type of drugs, how much of, of the drugs that we seized. So all that's provided in our reports. Does the region have any goals to reduce the d drug uh, problem that we have? Most definitely. Yeah. What um, are they? What's that? What are they? The as goal? far as what? The, as far the, the as goals? goals to reduce the, uh, by how much? How much um, reduction? Well, 5%, just, just 10%. enforcement. Um, we don't. I guess we don't have goals, like say how, like quantity wise. Like we're gonna like a quota type of deal. Is that what you're asking? Um, <clears throat> Basically, we we um, we're tasked with just enforcing enforcement. I mean, we go out there, and again, we we. Currently, we do have a couple of guys, two guys that is dedicated just for narcotics with the help of the rest of the street crimes unit. So roughly is about eight individuals that have the options or not the options, but the ability to go out and enforce the, the drug problem. I see. <clears throat> and what about the, the ones that are bringing in the drugs into our community? Have you had any leads or? Yes, um, we do have an, an MOU and we have some agreements with Mora. Mora County, um, we're we're working to get uh, we're we're working to expand back to the concept, the the original regional concept. Um, right now, we have uh, Las Vegas, San Miguel County, uh, Highlands, and Mora, and we're trying to expand further out. So, but again, the the biggest, the main, one of the biggest issues that we have is the cross commissioning. Uh, with the sheriffs. And as you guys know, Chris is, uh, Chris Lopez, interim chief, he's he's already on board. And we're actually looking to implement another agent with the, within the county, strictly uh, narcotics task force. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilor Casey, do you have a question? I just wanted to point out to Councilor Howell that the scope of work is listed in the contract that uh, is in our package, and it does say, you know, one operation per month, 80 felony arrests. That's the goal. 
-hmm. And then 500 grams of narcotics seized to include meth, heroin, crack, cocaine, powder cocaine, 50 pounds of marijuana, live plants, 40 firearm seizures. That's the goal. It doesn't mean that that's what will happen. It just depends. Mm -hmm. They may have more in some areas and less in others, depending on the drug trafficking that's taking place. But they, they do have measurable goals here so mm -hmm. that they have something that they can um, aim for. And again, the Street Crimes Unit is not strictly just uh, narcotics. We do have two narcotics agents that that's their focus. The Street Crimes can do a little bit of everything. So. I'd just like to hear um, comments about this. That's, that's why I asked. Okay. I have a question. Councilor <clears throat> Mr. Jenkins, uh, is that like the original four, like the, uh, what you're working with, or you're, it's nothing like that, or it's... Say again, I'm sorry? It's like the original four? Uh, I can't that. I can't. The region, regional four. Oh, region four, region yeah. Region four. What about it? I'm sorry. Is that almost the same thing that you, what you're putting together? This, it's the same thing. It really is the same thing. But we changed the name, we changed our uh, the focus, um, because we didn't have any buy-in from the other counties. Mm -hmm. So organizationally, we said, let's stop worrying about the other counties right now, and let's just focus on Las Vegas. So that's why we developed it as a street crimes unit. And that's when we submitted the grant um, the application, we utilize the street crimes unit to get the monies. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> answer, um, for me. So, so, Mr. Jenkins, so pretty much what we're hearing is that some of the other counties weren't doing their part, so we were actually having to send some of that money back because there are goals that they should be meeting and they weren't. So, is that where? <laughs> Basically, yeah. Okay. Yes. Just make yeah, yeah. That's what I got. They, yeah, sure. they they weren't. We said deliverables. Yes. And. They weren't doing anything. Um, when the application process came up, they were asking for equipment. They were asking for you know all sorts of things. Grant came out. They they get that stuff, and we weren't getting anything in return. And then when it came time to you know we were having to send the money, go to the the DAC meetings and having to revert money, and it was kind of getting embarrassing, being that we are the fiscal agent. Good good job. I just I mean. If they're not doing their job and money gets lost, I mean, better focus on ours. And, and so thank you guys. And then for we are, like I said before, we are branching out again. Yeah. I mean, right now, Mora's on board, and we're hoping to, to branch, uh, branch out a little further north to Raton and everything else. So we're, we, we are in communication with those. And, and, I, and again, going back to, I know, Councillor Howell's question, and I have a brother-in-law that's, that's uh, uh, Work with, works with APD, mm -hmm. and I know you know just in conversation with him that you know I know there's conversation you know even from mm -hmm. APD to to the local police department, you know so it's not just you know we're just focused here you know if there's big stuff happening there and it comes here that communication is happening no matter what. Councilor Howe, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, Deputy Chief. The this problem has been going on for a long time, uh, the drug problem that we have here. Um, are you in the Region 4 or the uh, Street Crime Unit involving uh, citizens that are willing to sit down with you and give you feedback um, in regards to what they see out there? Or, or is there a committee of um, citizens that are, are working with you? Believe it or not, that's probably one of the hardest things is to get the community involved in drug enforcement. Um, I think the biggest fear is retaliation, obviously. But we do have um, means of anonymous phone calls or tips or anything to that. Um, currently, we are trying to implement more um, PR, I guess, to where we're trying to get out there and just talking to people and saying, you know, what would you like to see differently done in the, in the community? Um, a lot of times people are willing, but most of the time they're not. Are you going into the schools also to always, yeah. do the always public always. relations? On that? Always, always. Yeah, because that's where we need to start anyways, <laughs> the young ones. And then um, we're still on board with the opioid stuff. Uh, even though Chris is gone, I'm, I've taken a helm on, on promoting that with, with, as far as representing the city goals. So we're, we're still on board. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. What is the pleasure of board consent? Consent. consent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy.
The next item on the agenda is Resolution uh, 18-42, Request to Continue Support of the Amtrak Southwest Chief Passenger Service through Las Vegas, New Mexico. And we have Ms. Virginia Maripo to present. Good evening, Ms. Maripo. How are you? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good evening. So, Today I wanted to present to you um, Resolution 18-42, basically supporting Amtrak and the Southwest Chief. Um, recently, Amtrak was undecided if they wanted to keep Southwest Chief. It was looking like it was going to go into a bus service, um, which thankfully that didn't happen, and a lot of it had to do with um, DOT not being able to clean the streets over in Gotham Pass during certain hours, which would affect uh, their scheduling. So they are keeping the Southwest Chief for another year. Um, and that was a lot to do with the community, our New Mexico representatives, and everyone else coming together and fighting. And the Senate actually did do an 98 2 vote um, to help support and see what we can do in the future with it. But Right now, what um, I was looking at, or what we're looking at, is the cities to be able to pass this resolution saying that we do support the Southwest Chief to continue service um, throughout Las Vegas, and so not just Las Vegas, but all of New Mexico, Colorado, and the whole uh, route from Chicago to LA. And right, we did, there was a waiver that was done for the FY19 fiscal year, so that's until October 2019. However, we still have a lot of work to do to continue it even past 2019. But the resolution is a start to say we're on board to support and keep the, tra the Southwest Chief right now through Las Vegas. Questions, comments? Just have Mr. Casey. <coughs> Just uh, the fifth, whereas. It says, whereas the train is a key economic contributor to Las Vegas, New Mexico, and northern New Mexico, including the cities of Raton, Santa Fe, and Laney. And then it has a comment that says, history of the train in Las Vegas. It doesn't fit in with the rest of the whereas in the sentence. You're talking about it's right. an economic contributor to places, but then it has history of the train. Well, looks like it. <laughs> Yeah, it's out of place. Yeah, it's out of place in that sentence. So you either need to remove it and make a new whereas that says, whereas the train also contributes greatly to the history uh, and the economic development of Las Vegas and other northern Mexico communities or something to that effect. But it shouldn't be in that same whereas. Right, and I agree. And uh, I think the best thing, because we do want to, um, include that it is an economic contributor as well sure. as the history of it so maybe we, we'll just we could separate the two ways. yeah i think that so would uh, sound a little bit better and then another typo on that same page on the next to the last whereas the second line uh, of should be a little o instead of a big one no, thank you and, uh, I'm, I'm That's all. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Mayor, I just have a question Thanks, as Mayor. to where the direction for this resolution came from. Was that you or, or Madam Mayor? Did you? Actually, um, it was myself. Uh, I was contacted by a lot of people to put together one a support letter, which I did, and we sent that. And then now, in addition to that, the other communities have adopted resolutions. In support of Amtrak. So, okay. and, and the reason why I ask, and I don't, I mean, I don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, fight over this issue. But on July 11th, I sent you an email requesting this resolution. This was back mm -hmm. in July. Well, we, I've been sending out letters for two years now. Okay, but the resolution is yeah. Is, the is resolution what I asked. Uh, the resolution came after the fact because we were waiting for other communities to put through the resolutions, and I will put it through. I thought at the time that the staff again also had the time to work on all these things. But yeah, I've been working on the Amtrak issue initially for about three years and then as mayor for the last two and a half years. So uh, the re we had different resolutions already. But And I appreciate that you gave me your input, so I always take that into consideration. But of course, I also have to take the 
um, the staff time into consideration as to where we can put things on the agenda. And, and it's a good thing. I just yeah. I just bring that up as you know, no, no, October and then it's a few months later. This is nothing new, Councilor Romero. No. I've been at this for three, three and a half years now. If, if I may, Madam Mayor and Council, um, Councilor, what um, Mayor is saying is correct. She's been at it for a while, but I've also followed this even before coming to exactly. the city. So coming so in. So what state officials have you worked it, with? It was when I was working with the Chamber of Commerce, we were actually working on a program um, to save the Southwest Chief, and that was about two years ago exactly. as well, yeah. Because so it's been an ongoing process, but mm -hmm. about a year ago, um, around the Fiesta's time last year, is when we started having this conversation of how to support. And the reason we brought the resolution now was because um, what was happening was the representatives, the mayors, the, all the New Mexico representatives, and everybody was getting together to figure out how we could do a resolution that um, all the cities and counties and everyone can bring uh, to the table and we're all kind of consistent in some way as well and we're not bringing um, different resolutions with different topics and that way it'd be easier when we do go you know to the state or as high as up as it goes um, even up to the presidency that it it all comes together in some kind of way. We were looking at consistency within the resolution Although, if you look at the Albuquerque resolution, it's a quite extensive in comparison to ours. And then that's that's one thing that I wanted to add, if we could, you know, just a suggestion. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's up for discussion. Is uh, the investment that Main Street and also Ellen uh, Apple? I don't know how to say. They felt, you know, those investments that that they have made. I mean, you know, I think that's some something in there in here that it, we could add those those into the, the uh, resolution. Well, I think that, that uh, we will be getting away from the uh, resolution that supports Amtrak, if we include that, because Ellen was there, we discussed, and um, this is about Amtrak. This is a not about Main Street. Main Street has their own resolutions that we acknowledge, but I think if we put it in, it might take away from the Amtrak resolution. No, no, we're just saying that we support it because of the investments that have been made here in Las Vegas. Well, Vegas. essentially, also, uh, Ellen was there during the presentation. But I don't know if we, we should put that in there. I think that that was the purpose of coming up with the resolution with um, everybody, like I said, all the New Mexico representatives, other citizens. I, I spoke to Heinrichs, and, I, Heinrichs yes, office, and that's what they suggested. In, in that email that I sent you, it's mm -hmm. I saw that I, one, but still. What see, I had sent, and I'm just. See, because Main Street yeah, gets a lot of the funding from us, so it's still the city of Las Vegas. But you're talking about the real, you're talking about the historic district. That's entirely, and tell me if I'm wrong, sole and separate from supporting the Amtrak funding. However, but, I do see a solution to it that we could do instead of specifically saying Alan or specifically mm -hmm. saying anybody else. Yeah, we mean, could include it as part of that whereas in the history of the train um, in, in Las Vegas, New Mexico, relating to the historic Because of the investments yeah, that have been made into the community. And that's, I'm, I'm sorry if that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's that's not a good idea. idea. Yeah. Yeah. We could tie it into that, but it'll be a couple of days. Okay, and I, that's not what I meant. Just, you know, the yeah. investment itself. I mean, we, I don't think I'm no, he wouldn't want his money. I know. So just yeah. the investments okay. that have okay, been made, so. and if we lose that, those investments. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I also uh, agree with uh, Councilor Romero in that if um, Legis um, Senator Heinrich had requested that through uh, his email, I think that would be a, a plus for us to include it in there. Mm -hmm. And that's a good solution, what we was And we've been about. working, I've been so, working with the mayor from, you know mm -hmm. that. Right. Yeah. And that's an easy solution because it does include everything. Go ahead and work on it. We won't, I would suggest we don't put it on consent so we can review it before. And if there's anything else that we need to change, we'll do that. Oh, good. Good. And, can I go? Yes, of course. Uh, also, um, I, I know you had uh, briefly talked about our trip to Lamy. Uh, Lamy had. I was uh, going to let you do all this. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> you're going to do it in the. Well, you're going to do it because okay. I don't like this. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, we did make a trip to Lamy. I think we represented the city of Las Vegas and San Miguel County. It was the mayor, myself, and uh, Virginia. Uh, that, also and, was and, yeah, that was my next. Uh, and, uh, future Commissioner Harold Garcia was there. And we spoke on the, our support to the group uh, about uh, trying to keep the uh, Amtrak service going through uh, our town and up to Raton and, and up to Chicago. 
And uh, I think there was there was over a hundred people there. Um, and uh, Alan Alfelt was there also. And we spoke uh, during that time. Uh, we recognized Mr. Alfelt in regards to his investment that he's making, both exactly. in the legal tender at Lamy and also um, Castaneda here. So um, it's really good. I think the officials from Amtrak and also the officials from uh, a Department of Transportation were there, and they re realized and recognized what we said out there. So um, it was good, and um, I'm glad we went there. So. Yeah, and Councillor's Mayor, um, during that meeting as well, the nice thing about it is not only do we have um, the our representatives for the City of Las Vegas, the DOT, the Amtrak, but we had the other ones, uh, the uh, Mayor Weber from mm -hmm. Santa Fe, um, Anna Commissioner from Santa Fe as well, and so it really brought everybody to understand that we're on the same page when it comes to supporting the Santa Fe. And I spoke with uh, Mayor Weber, and he really is interested in collaborating with Absolutely. Las Vegas in regards to uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to really sit down with him. I've been working with all of them. Good. It just Good. takes time. Mm -hmm. we, we got this far. We finally got the resolution. <laughs> so but it's, we're, we're been working real close to But thank you, Councilor Hall. Yes. And thank you for being my honored guest that day. I truly appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I would not suggest we put it on consent. We'll bring it back and then review it. If there's anything else you want to add, look at your resolution. Just the investment part. Yeah, just of course. The one that's investments that have been made in our okay. community. That's fair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, is to award RFP number 2019-02 to Animal Welfare Coalition of Northeastern New Mexico for animal services and shelter operations. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, Council. Um, so we did put an RFP out for the animal shelter, um, animal services and shelter operations. Uh, the reasoning for this is we did want to be able to do it in a way where we can offer multiple years um, in the contract so that whoever is awarded the RFP would have the advantage of being able to get grants um, it, they have a better chance of getting grants as far as infrastructure and anything else that they need. So we did put the RFP out. We had one offer who submitted, and that was the um, Animal Welfare Coalition of Northeastern New Mexico. And so today we're here um, meant to get Mayor Council's approval to go ahead and award them the RFP. Okay, questions, comments? Councilor Howell? No, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Okay. I just want to say, thank you. I just want to say that I received a couple of emails and also phone calls from uh, persons that could not um, make it to the meeting tonight to give their public input, but they are very excited and are very supportive of the Animal Welfare Absolutely. Coalition. And uh, each and every one said that you do amazing work, and I agree with them. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, it was all positive and good. So, okay, thank you. Very happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Council Hill. Uh, one more thing. I think, um, I think Mr. Pohl should start a um, capital fundraising um, uh -huh. pro uh, initiative here, and I think you you will see that you will receive tremendous amount of support uh, once that um, capital fundraiser initiative is worded properly and um, distributed properly, I think you, we're going to see realize our new shelter uh, within the, uh, the contract time period. So, so that would be good. That's our vision as well. Right. Councilor Rebecca, any questions? No. Mm -hmm. ready? No question. I want to commend you, Mr. Paul, for taking this program and making it a great program. It was a good program, now it's a great program. And I also want to commend the staff, uh, Andrew Gagos, our city manager, and also Virginia Marijuana, our community development director, Levi, all of them for working with you. Uh, Tina, you guys have really stepped it up. Uh, the professionalism that you bring to this organization is a commend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have the last word, Councilor <laughs> Hall. Okay, Councilor Hall. <laughs> I, I just, 
and and Ms. Gallegos knows that I, I brought this uh, subject up, <clears throat> the uh, skunk problem. Uh, oh, and, I, and I know that um, since I spoke to you last, we've I've had about four other community members call me and say that uh, on 8th Street at nighttime, uh, the cars have to stop. So they, they can see the skunks going across the road. <laughs> and and uh, boy, it's, and they don't want to roll their windows down because they, they can smell it. Because uh, the skunks get scared and they spray right out in the middle of the road. So, um, and it's not just on 8th Street. It's on uh, the areas that I spoke to you about. Yes, and I've also uh, talked to uh, property owners that have uh, big, large uh, properties that have a lot, a lot of weeds. And I asked them to uh, cut it down, mainly because uh, skunks like to hide in those type of areas. And then they come out at nighttime to uh, go look for uh, chickens or kitties or exactly. uh, what, whatever it is. Um, animal control officers, my question is, can they get trained on how to handle skunks? Okay, that, that is so a problem for the city of Las Vegas because at this point in time, Levi, could you address that um, policy? Because um, I get a lot of calls on that one. I was actually the one that worked pretty diligently about two years trying to get us to stop handling skunks. Uh, one of our officers got afraid in the face when I was supervisor at the time. And um, at that point, pest control started handling them. Uh, the city operates illegally, <coughs> to say it just bluntly. We have no authority to be picking up or transporting wildlife. Uh, per Chapter 17 of state statutes, um, it's not allowed unless you're an official game warden. Um, us transporting them, we have no no contract with anyone, any private property lands. No one's going to want to skunk on their property. So the only way that we would be able to dispose of them would be to euthanize every skunk that we picked up. Um, that's not a feasible uh, cost for the city. And uh, right now, pest control is handled. And my skunks are handled by pest control and are being handled. There is a small fee that is associated with the two businesses that we do give out. But um, for us to be picking them up, it, we don't have anywhere legally to transport them and, and uh, release them. With our, with our, if I may, if I may, uh, with our economics in our community, a hundred dollars per skunk is very expensive for them to put out, uh, and the skunk problem is not going to. Uh, be eliminated. I know that five years ago, approximately, uh, we had a contract with the county and the city where uh, someone from, I think it's the game warden um, officials, would come down from a different county and set the traps along the uh, areas that we um, notified them that there are a lot of skunks. And then uh, the skunks would get trapped. They would come and pick up the skunks and take them wherever. Uh, I don't know what they did with them, but uh, that helped us out, but then apparently our funding ran out, and I'd like to see if we can uh, take a look at again how both county and us, if we can bring them together to talk about this issue, because it's not just in the city of Las Vegas, but it's in the county, also. Yes, that, sir, uh, the pest control companies that we are referring out to are Elite Pest Control and Diamond Pro. Um, I know their general cost per skunk is $50, and that's with a uh, total setup of the trash removal and relocation. Um, well, they're telling the community members that call them it's $100 per skunk. What we deal with pretty often is going to be, when we were handling it, we were putting out city-owned traps on private property. Uh, skunks are pretty much nocturnal. They're only going to be moving at night, so an animal control officer would hardly ever uh, make contact with the skunk during working hours unless it's a dead one. Of course, the animal control officer will pick those up, but um, we came into the liability of private property owners stealing cages, damaging cages, or them saying that uh, city employees were going onto their property trespassing or they were causing criminal damage to property while they were on there. So it opened up a lot, a lot of liability for the city, as well as the cost that you're seeing uh, the citizens are having to pay a pest control company right now, the city was faced with those costs when we were going through the traps. And uh, honestly, officer safety as far as dealing with animals that can hold rabies and as well as um, them being sprayed or ruining clothing as well. So the question still lies, what are we going to do? I mean, the, the, the um, um, problem still exists. And it's not just a one or two, 
but it's families and, and uh, of skunks everywhere. Um, I, I believe there's underlying issues to skunks. Um, it's, there's always going to be wildlife. Um, when there's a drought, bears come into the city limits. When there's a nuisance, lots accumulation of solid waste, you're going to see skunks. And uh, those, uh, right now, the city it has a lot of nuisance lots throughout the property. And it is code enforcement's job to take care of it. But uh, honestly, right now, I have my plate full. Um, how you said overgrowth of weeds, that's going to attract skunks. Uh, accumulation of solid waste, that's going to attract uh, pests and vermin. So um, I think getting a better hold on code enforcement, uh, maybe an extra officer to assist with uh, the petty things as far as the nuisance code ranging from unsanitary premises, I think you'd see a change in the skunk problem. And then, of course, um, possibly working with the pest control companies, um, offering our traps or something to lower the cost uh, could be a possibility. Can we subsidize the pest control companies? We wouldn't be able to subsidize them, but what we would be able to do is control, uh, as, you, as uh, Levi has said, uh, do more, more code enforcement, uh, more uh, cleanup of the, uh, of the areas. And that's where it really is, that's where the primary uh, problem is, is that we have weed overgrowth in a lot of the, uh, in a lot of the yards, and so then it goes back to the homeowner. Um, now, what we could do is work with possibly the uh, the uh, coalition animal control to see what else we exactly. can do, what we what else we can and cannot do. We have three law uh, code enforcement officers at this point, and I think they've been on for about a month. They're uh, doing a, a, an awesome job. They're getting uh, trained in both animal control as well as code enforcement. That'll help Levi a lot. Uh, but for now, it is a $50 fee for uh, to trap a skunk. Uh, I believe that that's one of the one of them is $100, and a lot of them is $50. And so that would be the only thing that we can do uh, currently. Now, what we can do is uh, try to work on a long-term uh, long-term plan and bring it back to mayor council and put all the parties together. Yeah. Um, we did. We used to call wildlife. They won't take them anymore because we did that. Well, when uh, I, I believe we did that with a couple of your uh, constituents that were in, and we did try to call, and I think even the gentleman, the gentleman that we were, that you worked with, was um, was very educated on skunks and how to trap them and what he would do because he was not uh, he wasn't euthanizing them, he was really setting them aside and setting them uh, setting them free, but he was doing that on his own because he had so much overgrowth on in his area. And so what we will continue to do is work with the companies that we have and then possibly bring a, a long-term plan uh, back to Mayor Council and see how it, how we can work and we can all work together, Perfect. Oh, including the, the county, the city, and uh, the wildlife refuge as well. Did I, did I hear uh, you, Levi, say that you are still needing uh, more help? Even um, when you have the two? They just started. Uh, right now, they haven't really been trained in code enforcement. They are going to be dual, dual role or dual trained. Right. Um, right now, there's a lot for them to learn in Chapter 118, which is animal code. Um, as soon as they learn that and they're sufficient in that job, then they'll transfer um, duties over to code enforcement as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we really need to work together on this. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. One, one of the things that we're also doing is because they are new, um, I, I like to challenge my staff a lot. So one of the things I did is I did task them with the, the figuring out a long-term goal for how we are going to handle the skunks. What are the possibilities? Mm -hmm. um, what our options are and so on and so forth. So that is one of the big tasks I, I did provide them with. So they are currently doing all that research to figure out what we can do in the long term. Okay. Thank you very much, Councilor Casey. Thank you. At the risk of being laughed at, uh, I'm going to tell you how I handled the skunk <laughs> problem when I was the superintendent in a very rural area and had no money to buy uh, to purchase uh, services of, you know, professional pest control. Uh, I called pest control and they charged a lot because they had to travel to the school mm -hmm. district and uh, we had skunks and rattlesnakes and raccoons and you name it, we had it. And so they said, uh, we can't help you because you don't have money. <laughs> and <laughs> they said, but we would suggest to you that you buy uh, moth balls mm -hmm. or moth crystals and put them around the areas that you don't want these uh, animals to come into. 
And so I did that, and it really works. They got rid of the rattlesnakes because I had rattlesnakes in the playground. I had skunks that were uh, living under uh, the storage shed that we had. They got rid of every animal. Well, I didn't even have spiders. They all, every, every <laughs> animal just left, and it was wonderful. And so uh, it's very cheap. You can go to Walmart and buy a box of moth crystals for less than $5. And when uh, my constituents call me and they say, I have a skunk in my backyard, I tell them, buy a box of moth crystals or moth balls, put them out there, yes. and take your dog food inside yeah. so that they don't come mm -hmm. in and want to eat your dog food too. And so uh, it's a simple solution mm -hmm. that's cost effective and uh, just wanted to make that suggestion. It does work because I've tried it. Does. Mm -hmm. It does work. Yeah, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't take care of uh, dead skunks, or, uh, <clears throat> but it does get rid of the skunks around your house. Okay. Councillor I just I just want to follow up on, on what uh, Councillor Howell had said. Uh, I know winter's coming and it's not going to be a problem with the skunks here pretty soon. But you know, can we give like a two month where you guys could give us an update as to where you are with that plan? Is it something that you know? Yeah, just at least an update in two yes. months or so. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. So what is the plan for? Consent. 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 The next item on the agenda is resolution number 18-37, abatement of nuisance located at 1309 6th Street. We have Virginia and Lubai Luhan. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, give me a second. I'm just going to get this on so I can give you guys a brief presentation of this resolution. Have you grown? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he looks taller. Yeah. He, looks he just fine. cut his hair. It's a boot. 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 It's
All of these fall under Chapter 301, which is our nuisance code. In this picture, you can see uh, accumulation of tires, wood, uh, inoperable vehicles, filing cabinets, uh, boards. Um, throughout the whole property, it's hard to distinguish everything that's on there. Uh, a lot of a lot of solid waste. Uh, Since this picture, because um, I drove by there the other day myself, since this picture has actually accumulated a lot more in the front of that yard. Uh, He's it accumulated more? Goes, yeah, it basically goes all the way through that property. So, um, those are the first pictures I took of the property when I initiated the abatement process on it. Uh, the red tag was sent out how I see it June 20th, and it allowed Robert Dalton 12 days to come into compliance or to start abatement of his nuisances. Um, how Virginia just stated no compliance was made and yet he actually accumulated uh, quite a bit more onto that property. Um, these pictures are going to be of when I went out there on July 25th. Um, he removed some and he added, he added quite a bit. Um, we're getting calls from the adjacent property owner that he's also putting solid waste on their fence and on their walls um, to just store it. He has clothes out there. Yesterday that I went by to take my final pictures, it was raining, nothing's covered. Um, his solution to me telling him about these violations was that uh, he was having a yard sale. Um, so he put up an open sign um, as you go into his yard. But here as well, you can see that a lot of the, none of the solid waste was moved. Um, you could see Mr. Dalton and a few others sitting there when I take my pictures. Um, he kind of showed all of his regard to to uh, me asking him to comply. Uh, he was, I did talk to him every time that I went out there to take pictures. If, uh, sometimes I got called out there for animal violations as well with the dogs. Uh, again, um, in lieu of that, he was also made aware of these violations and just continued to work on them. So the second red tag was sent out July 25th, the same day that those pictures were taken. Uh, again, he was made aware and he was given the documentation of the violations that he was uh, violating municipal code. This second uh, violation notice gave him 19 days to come into compliance. Um, and if not, it made him aware that the city would commence abatement of the nuisances provided under our ordinance. These pictures were yesterday when I went back out there. Uh, his truck on city right away as well as full of solid waste. Um, he, he states that he didn't drop off those couches there on city right away. I don't know if the condition of the property is uh, making people think that that's somewhere that they could take their solid waste maybe for him to sell. Or, <laughs> he stated that the police just showed up there. And how you can see these barrels are starting to come all the way to the, almost to the city sidewalk. Yesterday, while I was taking these pictures, it's raining, there's uh, clothing out, nothing's covered, being protected. Um, eventually, with that as well, there's going to start to be a stench over as well. That's that open sign that we put up now. That was Mr. Dalton walking back onto his property after I'd spoken with him. And that's it. I'm open to any questions. Uh, the documentations that I gave you, that I gave you, the first one, Exhibit One, is going to be the informal letter that was sent out to him, dated April 16th. They're just making him aware of the violations. Uh, this, the second one, is going to be the first red tag, and the third one is going to be the second and final red tag that was sent out to him. Um, this case has been active and he's been aware of this since April 16th all the way to current day. It's way over the normal period that was given for the abatement process. And uh, he's also been cited into municipal court for these violations and has done nothing to correct them. Okay, questions, comments? Councilor Casey. Um, I want to thank Mr. Mahan for the work that he's done on this. Um, he's always uh, extremely responsive and I have um, a long list of 
properties that I have told them about. And uh, this is a, a good thing that's happening here because I've had a lot of complaints about this particular property and it does grow every day. There's more stuff out there. Um, the only negative thing that has happened, and I think it's a, you know, a good thing that um, everything, is, the, our agendas are posted on the website. And so a lot of my constituents uh, check the agendas and uh, they all called me up this week and they said, oh, we saw that, you know, that Dalton's property is going to get cleaned up. We're so happy. Do you think they could hurry up and do something with the property I reported? Mm -hmm. So everybody is like a firestorm of phone calls. Everybody wants everything cleaned yes. up right away. And so I explained the, the process to them. And they said, you know, it's not something that happens overnight. Right. This takes time. And there are timelines that, you know, people are given time to clean it up and that exactly. kind of thing. So, um, but I do want to thank Levi for the good job that he's doing, and um, I know it's probably very overwhelming because we mm -hmm. all call him up with uh, mm -hmm. various properties that need to be cleaned up, and uh, you know he's still basically alone there. So uh, I appreciate it when he does. And uh, I got a lot of calls on this property as well, as you know that, <laughs> and um, I do want to thank you for all that you do, Levi. Thank you. Uh, Virginia working with him the way you do. And I agree, you do need more staff. I know that uh, Ms. Gagos is working with you on that, and she's attempting to kind of push the uh, hiring process forward. So she's working on that as well. And thank you for all that you do. We all recognize right. you. Councilor Howell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Luhan. Thank you. <clears throat> How long has uh, Mr. Dalton owned that property? Um, let me see. How long he's owned it, I'm not too sure. Um, so he's that's his home? It's one of his many properties here okay. in the city of Las Vegas. So all of them look like this. He also has some right in our ETZ zone that also are accumulated. Mm -hmm. So all the like this. And you said you cited him in April? Uh, I cited him Started? the 30th of July. Of July. I cited him for, I was originally out there for an animal complaint. His dog was being aggressive for the people walking by. Uh, he was cited for restraint of animals, unenclosed premises, accumulation of solid waste, and uh, unsanitary check premises. What was the situation? Why did you mention an April date? Um, he was originally, uh, April 16th is right. when I originally went out there to talk to him. Okay. And um, as you can see on Exhibit 1, that's when that letter was sent out, April 16th. Okay. The, uh, when did the uh, complaints start coming in? Is it um, in April or it is it? It had to have been the beginning of April. Yeah. Um, usually I'll get out to my complaints within a five day period of receiving them. So I'm saying any, uh, anywhere in the beginning of April before the 16th. Okay. All right. And what type of communication after you spoke to him, what type of communication did he respond? Um, did you have an actual conversation? Yes, or sir. Um, I don't believe I'm knowledgeable enough to understand what Mr. Dalton um, sees on his property, so he doesn't see it as, uh, as a majority of people would. Um, that's what he enjoys doing is hoarding things and saving things. And um, I've talked to him and asked him to store it differently or possibly to where it's not creating a nuisance for the general public, but uh, it's hard to ask someone to change something where they don't see something wrong. And when you say that to him, what does he respond? That how he does he respond? That there's no issue. There's no issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And you are doing a great job. So I yeah. want to thank you. Thank you. Councilor, anybody? Yeah, uh, just want to commend you. You're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say uh, like six months ago, we had some uh, red tags back in the west side. Yes, sir. Like for like at least five or six red tags, and uh, they pulled them out. Uh, do you go back? Yes, sir. Do you um, go back to the residents that were, were, were red tagged and what's the situation? Do, they, uh, do you go back over there and check and see if they're, if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, cleaning up the yards or whatever? I remember I did have a list for me a while back uh, with pictures that were sent in to, that right. I received to my office. Um, every, everyone that I got was uh, did reach compliance. The only way that I won't go back to the property is if I reach compliance and close the case. But otherwise, the case will stay open. It will either go to municipal court um, with citations or it will proceed to 
council and mayor for uh, approval of the resolution to abate. All right, okay. Uh, because I, um, I I do live back in the on that side of the, the west side, and the, the four the four properties that I'm look that they complained about are they done they they done a little bit of work on them, but they haven't done you know complied to the uh, the court enforcement. I think that's what I'm looking at. Okay. And uh, one of the properties that they haven't really done anything. They in fact they just put another move uh, another camping trailer there, and you know. I'd, uh, I could, I, uh, because I had some residents call and complain about them. Okay. So I could maybe get back, get back with you on the on the on the address. Yeah, I'd be more than willing to meet with you. Um, I could show you the case files that I do have. Uh, a case won't close unless I have total compliance. Uh, right now, just based off of the list that I have, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly which ones you've given me, which ones have closed, okay. and which ones are currently still open. But I am willing to meet with you and have that. Okay, I will, well, I'll set up our meeting with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just Council. sort of add into what uh, Councillor Yulabri is saying. I know I've had you know, some properties also, and you know, one of them you, you guys took care of, and that we actually did the, the abatement. But uh, what is the, what is, the, I mean, I know right now, you know, you, you shorthanded, but what do you expect to turn around once you're fully, I mean, not fully stabbed, but at least with the two new code enforcement officers, is that going to go a little quicker? A code enforcement case, uh, legally, um, could range anywhere from about 10 days to over 60 days. Uh, Chapter 301 allows anywhere from a two-day notice to 15-day notice, and that's not including due process that's going to require uh, waiting for agenda meetings, uh, waiting for council's approval, um, research, county clerk research. Um, and hardly ever, I have never, since I started code enforcement six years ago, issued a two-day uh, compliance date. Uh, I want to try and give self-compliance due process, and uh, if my cases do land at Wind District Court, I want to show that I didn't give the due process that I probably should have. And so most of my cases are going to stretch to that 60-day period. Okay. So, so you're expecting a quicker turnaround with... Um, with more code enforcement officers, I say as far as the petty misdemeanors, as far as weed violations, uh, small nuisance lots, something like that, you could probably have a turnaround within a week. Um, my my self-compliance rate right now is around 97%. I handle over, probably last year I handled over 400 cases and 98% of those were self-compliant. So a lot of them you're not going to hear about. Um, of course, there is always going to be those nuisance lots in town that they're going to take longer or you don't see them getting uh, complied with. That one that we just recently abated on 831 Chavez Street, uh, that one was in the works for about two years. And it comes down to funding, uh, the legality of doing abatements. So there's a lot to it. And then finding the property owners? Yes, sir. Because I know, you know, that I've given uh, Ms. Gallegos a, you know, a few properties and, of course, they're rentals, you know, rentals that aren't uh, maintained. Okay. So, you know, that's probably even harder because you can't really give the tenant, or maybe you can, I don't know, do you give the tenant um, or the our, our municipal code states that everything's going to have to go through the legal listed property owner. So uh, our first stage when we get a, a, a notice of violation that's coming to our office is to go out there and investigate it. At that point, if we do see it, we'll go to the county assessors and pull that property card with the listed property owner. That's probably our easiest step out of everything that we do. <laughs> with more staff, be able, they'll be able to reach more of these properties, but the process is pretty much the same because you have to give the same amount of time to each person. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it will necessarily speed it up, but it will help to include even more of those properties. And I mean, because like right now, I know this month, Roland uh, got his progress report. He had like 45, I believe it was, open files. I mean, there's quite a bit that he's already handling, but we will be able to um, be able to attend to more of the properties. But the process will kind of and, and, and is there like a, a data system that you guys use? That and I know us, us as counselors, like Councillor you agree said, is you know he's mentioned some properties and just some type of data that we know at least it's on the list. You know, we have so many within, let's say, in my ward, or so many within your, you know, Councillor Yule Breeze ward. Councilor yeah, they used to hand out those reports in the past. You're always that. more than willing to contact my office and request it from me. But um, as well, a progress report is always done with the list of properties that I'm dealing with. I don't break it up into wards, but if that's something that would be mm -hmm. required that could be done. Um, we have tried different uh, servers or, or programs in the past. 
to all of our code enforcement software, but uh, they're not really sufficient. Um, right now, everything is kept in files on my computer, so everything is organized. I have uh, hard copies and soft copies of everything. Um, but as far as if you ever need an update or anything like that, feel free Just to Just so me. sometimes it feels like we're sometimes overburdensome maybe to the city manager, or, no. you know. You know, and then and I know, you know, they have so much on your plate, you guys have so much on your plate, and we, we don't want to become that burdensome, but at the same time, you know, yeah. we want to know. And I see where you're coming from. A lot a lot of what I could say right now, and it will be changing because we have these two other officers, but um, a case like this is going to require quite a bit of office work, so you're not going to be out in the field. Um, with having three officers, I could have myself or someone else dealing with the abatement process, which is going to require a lot of legal work. Uh, meeting with city attorneys to get the resolutions approved, um, my red tag notices, uh, county assessors, and then I have people out there issuing uh, municipal citations for petty uh, weed violations to where they could appear in court and the judge give an order and have a turnaround within a week or so. Also, he does provide a list of um, with the monthly progress reports to everyone. He yeah, the provide a are... list of all of them. So if anything, what I could do is include them with the progress reports. Okay. Um, and, and the last question would sure. be legalities. I know you know this this property here, the, the property owner we've had, you know the city has had issues with him in the past, and I think there's been uh, you know lawsuits versus the city and stuff like that. Uh, Matt, Madam Attorney, uh, you know we're okay with this. Uh, everything was followed. Do you see any pending litigation against us no, or no? Uh, from the documents I've received. Um, I don't foresee any problems. Okay. I could say that this case is probably going to go farther than a lot of might have. Um, I do see Dalton as a property owner for our ordinance. He does have the right to appeal a council's decision. So he can come up here and uh, have a hearing with council to fight this. Um, at that point, uh, it could go all the way to district. And that's what I'm sort of mm -hmm. envisioning yeah, so, in this. So. Um, I make sure that everything that I do, I'm confident enough to hold it in district court. So. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Gohan, uh, uh, how do you, how do you, uh, it, not, I, I know you're shorthanded on your workforce or whatever, but uh, say you, are, you have your court enforcement out there, the west side on the, around the city, how do you determine if they're a nuisance or the, your properties are bad, or do, do guys take a look at that, or, or do you have to get input from the from the uh, citizens, or the way a code enforcement officer is hired as is anything that could create a menace to the public health, welfare, or safety of the public. Um, that's we have a section 301-6. It ranges from unsanitary premises, hazardous premises, lit littering, uh, accumulation of solid waste, uh, outdoor vehicle storage, and operable vehicles. Uh, dangerous structures and buildings. Um, a lot right now, um, a lot right now is complaint basis. Um, I have 45 cases open right now and they're all complaint calls. None of them have been uh, self-initiated, I could tell you that. Um, with other officers out on the field, you can have them driving around if they see a nuisance stop and start a case on it, but right now I don't have that up. Okay, what is the uh, pleasure of the board? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Mayor. So, Lou Juan, um, th three areas. Uh, first area, uh, <clears throat> do you know who cleans the the uh, acequias behind 8th Street homes? I don't know if anybody can help me with that. That's going to be property owners. Oh. Yeah. So, well, they're, they're the acequias behind 8th uh, Street, all the they, homes. They hire certain individuals, the acequia association does, to clean out some of the acequias. I know the acequia madre. Um, uh, Councilor Olivarino, your brother, used to clean them from the Ezequiel Madre. I'm not sure if it went all the way up to 8th Street, I'm but sure. he handled a portion of it. But I know that there's money that the Ezequiel's have where they actually hire someone to clean up the Ezequiel's. Okay. But I'm not certain because if that's part of the Ezequiel Madre because the Ezequiel Madre is further down. So it might be uh, that Ezequiel hires someone. So the other Ezequiel's, what's the Ezequiel over here by where? I don't know. Mr. Alderete is at? Oh, is it the, was it the Rome, the Romero? I think it's, I thought, I thought it was the Romero. And, and I think that each of the Asequia yeah. organizations have, um, they have, have money or raise money to clean up 
Okay. So it's or the each responsibility of the estate council. Each one of the property yeah. owners as well. Exactly. Yes, if I could add to that is what happens is if they have water rights, then it's their responsibility exactly. to Exactly, and they all have water it. rights. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some, like I know the SECA behind our, 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 our place, is mm -hmm. we don't have water rights, yeah, so we don't have the responsibility. Yeah, so the Asequia, has you know, the, the their board, you know, is the res responsible to clean that area. But if you're a property owner and you have the water rights, then it's your responsibility mm -hmm. to yeah. The reason why I ask is uh, yeah. property yeah. owners are calling me and saying that the, the cleaning rubbish, the clean rubbish that they clean out the Asequias is against their property. So that's why uh, they're wondering who does that. that? Well, that would be the property, the, um, the sick, yeah. whoever does the cleaning, the cleaning. We should dispose of it as well. Okay. All right. Uh, right, your family uh, <clears throat> Second point. Um, <laughs> the uh, right behind, I, I know I've spoke to you, uh, Ms. Gallegos. Yes, sir. In regards to the rocks that are being against the uh, fence line of the housing authority. Um, Community members are telling me that kids kids go out there, they climb those rocks, they and they're afraid that skunks are going to be there, and they also are afraid that uh, uh, vermin or whatever uh, can go out there and harm the kids, and they want to know who put those rocks there, who's going to get it cleaned up, and uh, why are the rocks still there? Because it's been. Uh, a, a long, you know, more than a, a month or two. The last, Problem. I think the last conversation, Councillor, uh, Madam Mayor, Councillors, was that you were going to find out who the property owner was. You, we, you were going to contact them. I told you I would be glad to contact them as well. And so you and I can talk a little bit more about that if you'd like. But that was where I thought we had uh, kind of uh, agreed that we were going to find out who that property owner was in order to, and I believe it was the same property that we had talked about. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just, I'll get together yeah. with you. I, I'll okay. be glad to. But I I, the property that we talked about is the one across from uh, oh, Collins Drive, you know, with the weeds, but not. Uh, but we we also talked about the rocks, but we uh, did. We did. But talk we don't about know them. who the property owners are, uh, huh. unless it's the uh, paving company. So if, they, I'm, uh, if I'm given a description, I could I could find the property owner and okay. initiate a process. Yeah. On it. Councilor Romero took some pictures. Are you going to yield the floor to Councilor Romero? Well, no, I was going to ask him a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll yield the floor. Well, I also brought up, yes. I'm the one that also brought that up to you. Yes, and you did. that was actually on housing, uh, the Housing Authority property. And if you remember, I think I asked the housing, uh, Ms. Padillas, uh, you know, and they said that they would, they're waiting for the fiscal year and they would clean it up. Right. But and I guess that's a question that we could. Okay, I'll follow through with that. Okay. 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 I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. I really okay, now what is the pleasure of board? <laughs> consent. 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 Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very informative. The next item on the agenda, Madam Mayor, members of the council, is uh, resolution number 18 41, assuring the availability, availability of matching funds for the plan and design, construction, management, and construction of the municipal airport SRE building. Good evening. For the storage of the snow removal equipment as per FAA agreement. Mr. Gurule. Good evening, Mr. Gurule. How are you? I'd like to seek the approval of resolution 1841 for the maximum availability for the SRE building, which is the snow removal equipment building. Uh, we've got the snow removal equipment. And we, according to FAA, we do have to house it when it's not in use. And we do have to extend the building because it doesn't fit. It's a really big machine. And we can use salt on the runway, so it has a sweeper, which is pretty long. So, questions, comments? I'll come to you. Uh, I'll yield. Let me think. This, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, this is uh, another grant by from uh, that was distributed to the city of Las Vegas by the FAA um, organization, the, the federal FAA um, organization. Um, They've came, come in with a total project cost of approximately $89,000. Uh, our match is uh, $8,100. And we do have those funds available uh, for the airport. And therefore, everything is in order to, uh, 
to um, have the uh, the storage built for the snow remover. Mm -hmm. That was actually uh, purchased. That was actually uh, purchased by FAA as well. Okay, good. So I guess my, my question is, I know this is just for the, you know, to make sure the funds are going to be there, you know, the city's portion, but will there be the a bidding process? Will that be handled by us or by the FFA or how? Um, once we get the approval, then we'll go ahead and put <coughs> the bids. So we'll do that or I know. No, we, we have our, our engineer um, firm do it. Okay, yes. Which is the most important thing And they'll go ahead and we'll start the process that way. Yes. So it's for planning, designing, and construction, correct? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Guru Lee, hello. Uh, the snow removal equipment, is it going to be used by any other department? Uh, or just? For FA, we can't, they can't lend it to anybody else. They can't lend it. To be used in it for okay, all right. And it's going to be uh, this planning and design. Construction is going to happen on, in a hangar. No, it's uh, uh, or they another. Do have the snow equipment removed. The the building itself. Building. They're just going to extend the back of it because it I doesn't fit in. It's fit in it right now. Okay. There's no way to actually put it in there. Okay. They'd have to take it apart and separate it. Yeah. Good. Good. It, it's as wide as a runway. I see. And it's it, it, wide. Yeah. Wow. So we would. No one else would be able to uh, to make use of it. <laughs> It'd be a wonderful machine to use out here. To the in, one, uh, in, one, in one sweeping, in one sweeping, yes. <laughs> but we don't. We won't do that. That's not allowed. So, <laughs> one, one other point. Uh, maybe it's a little bit off tangent, but um, I, I understand that Mr. Billingsley got the go ahead to get his hanger or the hanger that he's been wanting. No, uh, we are still going through the process of uh, the city attorney reviewing uh, his uh, his proposal. His proposal. Yes, okay. Sir. Do you know how long that's going to take? Uh, she has not. I have I have the paperwork in my office, and so I will be t sending it over to her. Okay. Letting her take a look at it. Um, there is a couple of issues, but. Um, okay. I'll He's very her. anxious. Uh, yes, he is, sir. Mm -hmm. and I I have it on my listing for her. All right. I will get it to her as quickly as I can. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. No questions. Well, it's a pleasure to work. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Rivera. Thank you. And I believe that um, I, uh, I'm sorry to inform you that uh, Ms. Tana Vega must have uh, taken ill or her father has been uh, pretty ill. And she was supposed to be here to uh, present uh, resolution number 18-43, a budget adjustment resolution. With your permission, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I can present on her behalf. If, uh, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The budget resolution, and this one is the first resolution that we have for the year. Uh, we amend our budgets to uh, pick up all of the uh, different grants uh, that have been uh, funded over to the city of Las Vegas after the September uh, final budget uh, adjustments have been submitted to DFA. The first one is the Lodgers tax. There was an excess of 60000 in cash balance and uh, the uh, Lodgers Tax Advisory Board has requested that we uh, increase the budget by 60000 in publications and advertising. Uh, the next one is a CLG grant. This was for uh, $24,999 for the CLG grant to complete the old uh, old uh, city hall uh, uh, renovations as well. Uh, the legislature uh, appropriation uh, was, we were funded for $101,000, $101, and that was for senior uh, parking lot improvements. Uh, the 214 is the planning, design, and construction for Mountain View Drive to uh, Grand Avenue, and uh, that was um, for $274,711. We also had uh, uh, co-op projects for West National to South Pacific of $190,485, and of course a design of West National to South uh, to South. Uh, to the South Grand Avenue, uh, to South King Street and West National, to Southwest National, uh, and that was for $33,611. Uh, 
uh, with, uh, of course, the expenditure being 44815 and the difference is our, our matching from the City of Las Vegas. The Senior Employment Program, uh, seniors uh, were awarded $10,959 for senior employment for the senior, uh, senior Employment Program at the Senior Citizens. The loan proceeds for Story Lake was $4,090,681, and that went into the uh, water uh, storage uh, uh, water storage uh, for Story Lake. Uh, let me see. The uh, debt service is also, we also included the debt service of uh, $447,108, and that included principal and interest payable to New Mexico Finance Authority for the first payment of Story Lake. Uh, the Federal Aviation uh, Lighting Project of uh, $269,139, and that was also for the uh, Las Vegas Airport, and that was funded by FAA as well. Uh, we also had the $89,100 that you just uh, approved, that, that you recommended for approval for $89,100, and that was for building modifications. And we have we uh, we were awarded twenty thousand for general supplies and materials for the airport as well. The total revenues was uh, five million one hundred sixty four thousand seven hundred eighty five dollars. Total expenditures was five million six hundred eighty six thousand four hundred ninety two dollars, and that is included in resolution eighteen dash forty three. Thank you very much, Question. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. Davis, uh, who worked on all these aviation grants? <coughs> who was uh, uh, the person? <clears throat> FAA uh, comes in and works with the staff. Uh, Danny Wurle is uh, one of the primary, uh, one of the primary uh, persons who they uh, who they Spoken. contact. Yes, Spoken. and then he, he comes in and we'll get him the information he needs if he needs anything. Uh, we'll review his resolutions, yes, um, but FAA is the one who actually comes in and uh, uh, has uh, does inspections on the airport and then recommends different projects for us. Mr. Gurule works with them to, Absolutely, to get sir. this. Oh, yes, sir. Great job, Mr. Gurule. Thank you for getting Thank this done because we really need that help. Any other questions? One, one question. On the 60000 from the carryover, the cash balance? Yes, sir. How, how was it that uh, the lodgers board request, I mean, how, that they're, they're the ones that get the 60000 They don't get it. It's the lodgers tax. Uh, it's the lodgers tax uh, budget. Uh, they're the ones who recommend to mayor and council what, uh, what, uh, what kind of budget they should have. They come with their recommendations to mayor and council but they uh, go through the, their advisory board first. Uh, and I want to say that they serve in the advisory capacity. Yes. So if the council doesn't feel that what they're funding or their request for funding is justifiable, then you also have that authority to say, well, I don't support this. Oh, well, and that's, that was my next question yes, is sir. to, if you have, I don't know, maybe Ms. Marujo, you know, if she had a sort of a general idea as to that 60000 for publication and advertisement, just some ideas so we know, you know, Absolutely. where that funding will go. Yeah, so, um, Madam Mayor, uh, they have made a budget suggestion when we were doing our budgets. And one of the things that they had did is they were recently paying about two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the firm, and since we no longer have the firm, what they're doing is they're suggesting we spend at least at least the sixty thousand in the advertising. So, for example, that's going to go towards um, any other grants we get, like maybe through New Mexico Troop or Flex grants, any of the billboards, um, all, um, all, most of the advertising website and other things that we're currently doing in house. So instead of spending the entire $200,000, $250,000, they've actually broke it up and said, okay, well, staff needs to have at least the $60,000, you know, for the advertising and marketing and such. And, um, and then they also broke it down, you know, for nonprofits and infrastructure and so on and so forth. But that 60 is part of the percentage that they had recommended to council during the budget. Okay, so 
the way I understood it is that sixty thousand was going to be used for publication and advertisement. Is that so? It's not. It's going to go for other stuff too. Well, it'll go uh, mostly for any of the marketing, publications, advertisement. No, they're all tied into publication, billboards, and different things of those. And they were just waiting for our cash balances to come in, our final cash balances to come in. And this is why the sixty thousand there was sixty thousand in additional funding that wasn't uh, spent last year that was just carried over to this year. The cash is already in place. All they were trying to do is place it into uh, publications and advertising. And I'm just wondering the priority, you know, the, the, the carryover, this, you know, the sixty thousand versus. I know, you know, we had Mr. Luhan say they need some help, part time help. I'm just. You know, trying to to well, balance the need. Well, you can't touch the lodger's tax fund. That's separate. You can't pull that money and put it into. No, but it's coming fund. from the cash balance. The cash balance from lodger's board is what you're saying. No, yeah. it comes from lodger's tax. Exactly. Itself. Yeah, oh, lodger's okay. tax okay. is used it's specifically a different tax fund. for certain purposes, such as. And certain it's designated by by law. Okay, I thought. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was coming from the Only sixty thousand was coming from the general into. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't explain okay, it. Okay, yeah, that's what I was yeah. I was wondering. Okay. Miss Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can pronounce your name first name better than I can pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. Uh, just just one point. The <clears throat> Lodgers Tax Board meeting uh, is scheduled for November 6th, I believe, and that's the uh, day of voting. So there's some concerns there. Um, just just FYI. Oh, so there's early voting. <laughs> What's that? There's early voting. Yeah, I know, but... It's only an hour usually. Um, um, just, just letting you know. <laughs> Thank you, That's Councilor Howe. Uh, and I'll bring that. We'll bring that up. Yes. yes. If they don't want to use the that Okay. Because we haven't Thank quite you. yet put out the publication. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Howe. Okay. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. No other questions. What's the pleasure of the board? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and for the council. Uh, next is executive. I believe we have a uh, need for executive session, correct? Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, yes, we do. We have a need for executive session on both A and B. Okay. Uh, I need a motion to appoint executive. Madam Mayor. Council, please. I move that we convene uh, into executive session for the purpose of discussing personal matters as uh, permitted by Section 10-15-1H2 of the New Mexico Meetings Act and MSA 1978. And also for matters subject to the attorney client privilege pertaining to written litigation in which the city of Las Vegas may become a participant as permitted by section 15-1H7 of the Mexico Open Meeting Act 1978. Second. Second. Okay. Councilor Romero? Yes. Councilor Howell? Yes. Councilor Casey? Yes. Councilor Unibody Jr.? Yes. Have a motion by Councilor Casey, a second by Councilor Howell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Motion carries. It's convenient to Executive and to the City Manager's Office, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.